لا أقسم بيوم القيامة. It's got more meaning to it. So it's an extra emphasis. And probably the reason for that extra emphasis is when the disbelievers were so strong in denying its existence, so Allah brought extra emphasis in swearing that it, it exists. الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, first of all, what I would just like to do is to add a few points to what we spoke about last week. There are one or two areas where I just want to go into a little bit more detail, uh, which maybe we missed out. And I wondered maybe we covered them in just Amma, but perhaps it's worth just to make a couple of extra points. So we just take five, ten minutes just to cover a couple of things from last week. First of all, we covered in just Amma in Surat al-Balad this issue of starting an oath with La La uqsinu bihada al-Balad and here we've got La uqsinu bi yawmil qiyamah why does it start with La Ibn Kathir mentions it himself I might have to put this up here so I think to put it here in copy Ibn Kathir himself he said قَدْ تَقَدَّمَ غَيْرَ مَرَّةٌ أَنَّ الْمُقْسَمَ عَلَيْهِ إِذَا كَانَ مُنْتَفِيًا جَازَ الْإِتِيَانُ بِلَا He said, we've already spoken a number of times that if, and I'll give you the meaning of what he said, if this is something that people deny, if it's something that people deny, you can bring la in front of it. So the la doesn't mean I'm not swearing. It's not that Allah. And some of the scholars, they said that. They said the la, it is what it says. It is Allah is saying, I'm not swearing by Yawm Al-Qiyamah because it doesn't need, it doesn't even need an oath. It's so clear that it's going to happen. But that is, yani not what comes to mind when you read the ayah. That's not what is like, what, that's a very kind of uh, long way around the issue. But generally, what we understood from it is that when people deny something and you swear to the truth of it, in this case, you can bring any, in the language of the Arabs, they bring la. That's what Ibn Kathir, he means when he says, You can bring la. Others, they said, it just is emphasis. But I wanted to bring an extra point here. So there's, there's, oh. so I wanted to bring an extra point here. And the extra point is, sometimes you hear people use words like za'idah. This la is extra. It's extra. Now we might be able to say that in Arabic, but we can't say it about the Qur'an. We can't say that the Qur'an contains something which is extra, unneeded. Kind of an extra, an extra word that doesn't have any meaning. In the language of the Arabs, we might be able to say that. We could say in the language of the Arabs, harfun za'id, something extra. We could say that. For example, I remember one of our teachers, he used to say to us like a little line of poetry. He used to say, Ya taliba ilmin khud fa'ida, ma ba'da idha takun za'ida. He said, in a line, little line of poetry to remember, every time ma comes after idha, it is za'ida. And it doesn't have an extra meaning. Idha ma, it doesn't, the ma doesn't have extra meaning. That's fine fi kalam al-Arab. But it's no good in the Qur'an. We can't say that the Qur'an contains harfun zaid, something which is unnecessarily added extra. So what do we say? We say that it's for ta'kid, extra emphasis, or that it gives us additional 
يعني additional emphasis and, and highlighting on the sentence. You could say that. But what Ibn Kathir says here is not that. He says effectively when it is something that the people are in a state of denying it. And people deny it. They deny Yawm al Qiyamah. And you are affirming that it is true. In this case, you bring La. He brought that and he has one opinion. And others, they said it's for emphasis. And others, they said no. It is because it doesn't even need an oath. It's so clear that it's going to happen. It doesn't need any oath. But in any case, what I wanted you to understand here is just two simple things. The la here gives you extra emphasis, extra meaning. It gives you extra, and it's more than just saying, for example, وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا Where Allah swears by the sun, duha. it's more than that. It's got more meaning. La أُقْسِمُ بِيَوْمِ الْقِيَامِ It's got more meaning to it. So it's an extra emphasis. And probably the reason for that extra emphasis is when the disbelievers were so strong in denying its existence, so Allah brought extra emphasis in swearing that it, it exists. And Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. The next point I wanted to add is, why did Allah Azza wa Jalla mention the Ridham? أَيَحْسَبُ الْإِنسَانُ أَنَّنْ نَجْمَعَ عِظَام For example, it would have been possible to say, does mankind think he will not be resurrected? Why did Allah say, does mankind think that we cannot bring his bones together? Why the bones? Yeah. Why mention the bones? I mean, it's also possible to say, does mankind think that he will not be resurrected? Does mankind think there will be no qiyamah? Does mankind think there will be no hisab? Why mention the bones? There are perhaps two reasons we can highlight in the books of tafsir for the mentioning of this. The most obvious one is, that the non-Muslims brought these words when they denied the Qiyamah. They denied it like that. أَإِذَا كُنَّا uh, If we are عِظَامًا وَرُثَاتًا If we are bones and we are dust, they themselves brought this argument. They many times said, if we are bones, how will Allah resurrect us? When we are dust, from when our bones turn to dust, how will Allah bring our bones back? So when they mention this as one of their, you can say, uh, yeah, I need the, the batil, the falsehood, the shubuhat, the doubts they mention. So Allah emphasized that not just I will resurrect you, not just that I will take you to account, but your bones that you said turn to dust, I'm going to bring every one of those bones back in its place. And also, because if the bones come together, it's like the whole person came together, right? Like it's not just like their soul came back, or it's not just like any, the bone is like the structure of the person. If every bone is in place, so will the flesh be in place, the eyes, they sit inside the skull, right? The, the brain is inside the head and the heart is inside the chest. It's like everything will be back how it was. It's kind of an emphasis like that. As opposed to just resurrection, there's less emphasis in just the idea that you'll be, I mean, re your soul resurrected or that you will, for example, read your deeds. But for to say to someone that every bone that you had in this life will be brought back in the same place that it was, this is a very strong emphasis in really responding to what they said. Because they said our bones are going to turn to dust. Who is going to? Who is going to bring the bones back to life when the bones have just turned into dust? And when we look at the grave, we just see a couple of, of bones and dust in the grave. Who is going to bring this back to life? So Allah Azza wa Jal spoke about the Ivan for this reason. Uh, with regard to the statement Bala ala banana, there are really two opinions with regard to this. We mentioned one of them, but we're just gonna highlight. One of them is that Allah is again emphasizing the detail of the resurrection by saying that even the tips of your fingers, we're gonna resurrect them. 
And there is something here that is worthwhile mentioning. You know that you've, if you listen to some of my classes, sometimes I get upset about what they call al-i'jaz al scientific miracles. I, I tell people don't get too hooked up on it and don't get too uh, thinking about it too much. There's too much exaggeration in this. and People bring tafsir that doesn't exist. Change the word meanings just to match the science. But here there really is, and it is worthwhile mentioning that it is a kind of ijaz that the banat, the tips of the fingers are mentioned. Because we know, from, from what all of us know, that from the most precise and detailed parts of a person's body are their fingertips. That contains their identity, like now you put your fingertips for your, your fingerprints for your identity. And it's a very detailed part of the body. So there is nothing wrong with mentioning this min bab al-ijaz al-ilmi. There's nothing wrong with it because you're not changing the tafsir of the ayah. You're not adding something that's not there. You're not speaking about something that is unproven or unknown. But just that we know that one of the most intricate and detailed parts of a person are the tips of their fingers. And so if Allah speaks about resurrecting you to the tips of your fingers, then no doubt if your fingertips are resurrected and your fingerprint is resurrected, so will the rest of you with all of the things that you had and all of the deeds that you had. So there is something about the precision of that. Some of them said that what Allah is saying uh, here with the words banana, is that Allah not only could, can he resurrect you as you were, but he can resurrect you with more than what you were. In some of them, they took the word nusawwiya banana, like your finger, fingers will become like um, all the same length, like, a part, like for example, the hoof of a camel, or like for example, uh, how the animals, some of them, they don't have individual fingers, or some of them, the length of their toes is all the same. Some of them took it like that, like if we, in the sense that if we can resurrect you, we can even resurrect you different to how you were. Not only exactly how you were, we could change the shape of your hands. So don't think that it's only we can resurrect you how you were. We could resurrect you in a way that was different or better or more than what you were before. As yet, I need with more than what you had before. And that is also a kind of emphasis, right? It's saying that if I, and Allah tells you, if I can not only can I resurrect you how you were in this life, rather I can resurrect you in a way that is more than what you had in this life. I can give you more than what you had. And if I can give you more than what you had, then certainly I can create you and recreate you and bring you back how you were with your deeds and take you to account for those deeds. So all of this is part of the emphasis which is put on how a person will be resurrected without any doubt. And if Allah Azza wa Jal, the implication is if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so precise that even your fingertips will be brought back and even the shape of your hands will be brought back and all of your bones will be brought back, so will your deeds be brought back. So will everything that you have done in your life be brought back. Every small deed and every large deed will also be presented for you because Allah is not going to let anything go. And likewise, that is part of the statement. Bala qadirina ala musawiya banana. Rather, we are capable of bringing back the shape of his fingertips. We are capable of resurrecting him even to the tips of his, even to the tips of his fingers. In the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, One of the things I mentioned is, I mentioned this either about the disbelievers at takrib. So if it's about the disbelievers, the meaning here is, يُرِيدُ الْإِنسَانُ لِيَفْجُرَ أَمَامَ لِيُكَذِّبَ and he's going to deny the qiyama that is in front of him. But there is something else in this. Because the word yafjura 
al-fujur means sins, right? Like doing wickedness and evil and sins. So some of the scholars, they looked at the word yafjura and said this word is associated with sins. Meaning, rather a person is happy to continue sinning and disobeying Allah and forgetting about what is in front of them. So those are two means, not one mean. I think last week we kind of, the way we explained it, we kind of focused on takbib, the idea of denying what is coming. In the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, بَلْ يُرِيدُ الْإِنسَانُ لِيَفْجُرَ أَمَامًا He's going to deny what is coming ahead. He's going to deny what is in front of him. Deny the qiyamah that is in front of him. We covered that last week. But there is another meaning. I alluded to it, but I'm not sure how much I emphasized it. The word يَفْجُرَ meaning al-fujur wal-isyan يعني al-fusuq doing wicked deeds and sins meaning that a person is happy to sin without thinking of what will be in front of him. And you can actually see this is a theme of the surah, to be honest with you. What do I mean by that? There is a theme in the surah of not thinking about the consequences of what comes later. The meaning comes more than once in the surah. The idea of not thinking about the consequences of what you do and what is coming. Not thinking about what's going to happen next. And that is something that you could actually say could be applied, even though the ayah refers to the disbeliever, it could be applied to the believer also. And you could have a, a Muslim who behaves like that to a certain extent. I mean, we see, we disobey Allah and we don't think about the consequences of what is ahead of us, of that sin when we meet Allah Azza wa Jal. So that is part of the meaning that you can take. Yes, Alu Ayyana Yawmul Qiyamah we covered and we came to the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, Fa'idha Bariq al Basar. Here there are two ways of reciting. Uh, Nafir recites Baraka. Fa'idha. Baraq al-Basar fi qiraati nafi' nafi' rahimahullah ta'ala he reads Baraq al-Basar and the others they read Bariqa fa'idha Bariqa al-Basar some of the scholars differentiate between them so if we've remembered what we said about qiraat we've said that the qiraat sometimes the meaning doesn't change right when the meaning of each qira'ah is different from the other, the benefit is that you get two tafsir for the price of one. You get the tafsir of each different way of reading, both of them become true. And you can take them both together. And the reason I mention that is that some of the scholars differentiated between the meaning of baraka and bariqa. And some of them did, some of them said they mean the same. They mean the same thing. Let's read what Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala he said. وَقَالَ تَعَالَ هَا هُنَا فَإِذَا بَرِقَ الْبَصَرِ He said, قَرَأَ أَبُوْ عَمْرِ ibn al-Ala بَرِقَ So he said Abu Amr, not Nafi'. I said Nafi'. Here it's Abu Amr. My mistake. What I wrote down is Nafi'. But he said Abu Amr. So Abu Amr, he reads Bariqa, Bikasr al-Ra. He said, Ay Hara. Wahada al-Ladi qalahu shabihum bi qawli Allahi ta'ala la yartaddu ilayhim tarfuhum. Ay bal yanzuruna min al-faza'i hakada wa hakada la yastakirru lahum basarun ala shay'in min shiddat al-ru'ab. So he says, Bariqa, what it means is that their eyes don't settle on one place. Because they're so terrified and so scared, their eyes don't stay in one place. And this meaning actually comes many times in the Quran. For example, in Surah Ibrahim, La yartaddu ilayhim tarfuhum. Their sight doesn't come back to them. 
they don't let their eyes rest on anything. It's like their eyes are moving everywhere. They can't focus on anything because of how terrified they are. And this actually, if you think about it, is an example even today we give for someone who is terrified. Like the eyes are shooting everywhere. The eyes going left, right, up, down. Like he can't control his eyes. In his eyes, he can't look at one thing. Instead of looking at one thing, he's looking left and right and up and down. And he's like looking behind him and around him. He's scared. And because of how scared he is, his eyes don't rest on, he can't settle on looking at one thing. His eyes are darting around. That's one meaning that he mentioned. So it is baraka is nafi qira'at nafi. That's he said baraka fa'idha. So baraka is Abu Amr. Fa'idha baraka al basar and baraka. Baraka is Abu Amr and others, and baraka is qira'at nafi. That's what I thought. Bil fatah. He said it's near to the meaning of the first one. Wa qaribun fil ma'na min al awwal. Wal maqsud an al abasar. تنبهر يوم القيامة وتخشع وتحاب وتذل من شدة الأهوال ومن عظم ما تشاهده يوم القيامة من الأمور. So he he brings Ibn Kathir. He only brings one opinion here. He says it's near to the meaning of the other one that the eyesight doesn't settle on one place and that it uh, that it's scared and that it becomes like humiliated from the severity of what is happening on that day. Some of the scholars, they didn't take it about Yom Al-Qiyamah at all. They took it as عند الموت, when a person dies, like when the person's eyes, what happens to the person's eyes when they die, like that the eyes follow the, the soul and then the eyes close. And they took it like that, that this term refers to the moment of death. But most of the scholars of Tafsir, they said it refers to Yom Al-Qiyam. Some of them said the difference is that one of these two meanings, it means they can't, can't, they're not in control of their sight. They lost control of it. They're trying to look at something, but they can't look at it. Their sight is all over the place. And others, they took it as the meaning of humility and like their eyes are lowered down because they're, they're humiliated in a state of humiliation. And some of them said the meaning is the same. And Ibn Kathir, he said it is because of the severity of what they see Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Khusuf is the eclipse. So what does the meaning khasafa mean here? It means the light went away. Wakhasafa al qamar Khasaf al Qamar, the light of the moon went away. The moon's light went away. Some of them they said the difference between Al Khusuf and Al Khusuf is that Al Khusuf with the heart that's mentioned here, there's no light at all. It's complete darkness. And we know we've already covered in Juz Amma, uh, for example, in Surah Al Takwim, either Shamsu Kubirat. We covered it already. The issue of the light of the sun being wound up, the sun's light going away, the light of the moon going away. And some of them said, Al Kusuf, it's like when just part of the light goes away. But Khasafa here, there's no light. The complete light is gone from the moon. Wajumi'a shamsu wal qamar. Jumi'a means they. The sun and the moon come together. The sun and the moon come together. So the question is, what do they come together say? وَجُمِعَ الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرِ Remember, the sun hasn't been mentioned in the surah until now. This is the first time. The moon's light is mentioned. فَإِذَا بَرِقَ الْبَصَرِ وَخَسَفَ الْقَمَرِ Now the light of the, the moon has gone. The light of the moon is gone. But it doesn't mention about the sun until it says, So one opinion about Jumi'ah means 
Jumia, meaning it goes with the moon in the light going away. And the light of the sun will go like the moon. So the sun and the moon are together in the sense that the light of them will go away. That is one opinion. Jumia here means they share the characteristic that the light will go away. But that's not the opinion that is the most common. The one that is the most common is the one that Ibn Kathir mentions here. He said, قَالَ مُجَاهِدْ كُوِّرَا وَقَرَ أَبْنُ زَيْدٍ عِنْدَ تَفْسِيرِ هَذِهِ الْآيَةِ إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ وَإِذَا النُّجُمُ كَدَرَتْ وَرَوَى أَنْ إِبْنِ مَسْعُودٍ رضي الله عنه أنه قرأ وجمع بين الشمس والقمر. So the most common tafsir, the one that we we have here, Ibn Kathir mentions more than one in his full tafsir, if I'm not mistaken. But in the summary here, is that so when we said about the sun in Surah Al-Takwir, the shams, we mentioned the hadith of the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم that the sun and the moon will be wound up and put into Jahannam. Will be wound up and cast into Jahannam. And that is what comes to mind in the tafsir. وَجُمِعَ الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ The sun and the moon will both be wound up and cast into Jahannam. Be careful here about a mistaken tafsir which is not correct which some people might not be able to tell the difference between it and the correct one. And that is that the sun and the moon will become the fire of Jahannam. And that the fire of Jahannam will come from the fire of the sun. This is not correct. Why? First of all, it's not mentioned in the hadith. That's the first issue. But more than that, the fire is present today. The fire being kindled, the Yom Al-Qiyamah, no problem. And it's becoming big and the fire becoming very strong, that's no issue. But the idea that Jahannam will come because of the sun, one of the principles we have in belief in Al-Yawm Al-Akhir is that Jannah and Jahannam have already been created. So that is an, I mean, it's wrong to say that the sun will become Jahannam. Rather, the sun will be cast into, will be wound up. The sun and the moon will be wound up and cast into Jahannam. This is what was reported and we mentioned the details of it. And that's what Ibn Zayd recited when he came to the tafsir. He said the meaning of وَجُمِعَ الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ The meaning is إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدَرَتْ So he's making tafsir of the Qur'an with the Qur'an. You see the tafsir of this ayah is the same tafsir of Surah Al-Takwir إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدَرَتْ that's exactly the tafsir of وَجُمِعَ الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرِ It's narrated that Ibn Mas'ud used to read وَجُمِعَ بَيْنَ الشَّمْسِ وَالْقَمَرِ The sun and the moon will be brought together. Will be brought together. يَقُولُ الْإِنسَانُ يَوْمَ إِذِ أَيْنَ الْمَصَرِ أي إذا عاين Ibn Adam هذه الأهوال يوم القيامة حين إذن يريد أن يسر ويقول أين المصر أي هل من ملجاء أو مائل وهي سد هل من ملجاء أو مائل هل من ملجاء أو مائل he said that when Ibn Adam sees what will happen يوم القيامة and their eyesight is darting around. They see the sun being wound up. And they see the light of the moon disappear and the stars falling down. They see the earth replaced with another earth. And the situation is so severe that their eyes cannot, they have no control of their eyes. They lost control of their eyes looking around everywhere. In this situation, what would a person look for? Ain al where can I run to? Where can I run away? And that's why, really, 
when a person is in a very severe situation, they really look for any, you can see a couple of things. They either look for someone who can protect them. They look for someone. And give me somebody who is strong enough, who is powerful enough. Like if there's a war or if there's a you know something very bad, like there, there's no more, for example, the loss of safety and there's fighting on the streets. And let me find a, someone who can protect me or let me run far away to a place that is away from all the people, a place which is... And it can give me some protection and I can hide it. Like people in the t olden times used to run to the mountains. If there was a war, the people would run to the mountains. And they would say, I will just stay in the mountains. I will not be harmed by the, the war that is happening on the ground. Maybe until today, people do that in some places. So this is what is meant here. In Ain al Nafar, where can I run to? Is there a fortress? Is there a mountain? Is there a person who can I can run to that somebody can protect me from what is happening in front of my eyes? Kalla la was Kalla is used to rebuke someone. We use this, this statement Kalla to rebuke something which is a wrong concept. Kalla. There is no way, there is no place for you to run. There is no escape. There is no one going to protect you. There is no shafa'ah unless Allah gives permission. There is nothing going to save you, Yawm Al-Qiyam. And there is no place for you to run to. He said, Qala ibn Mas'ud wa ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhu wa Sa'id ibn Jubayr wa ghayru wahid min al-salaf ayla najah. وهذه الآية كقوله تعالى ما لكم من ملجأ يومئذ وما لكم من نكير أي ليس لكم مكان تتنكرون فيه وكذا قال هنا لا وزر أي ليس لكم مكان تعتصمون فيه He said that a number of the early generations they said لا نجاة there is no safety there is no place that is safe for you. And he said, this is like the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ مَلْجَأٍ You have no melja, no place to go back to, to be safe. وَمَا لَكُمْ مِنْ نَكِيرٍ And you don't have any place that you can hide. So there are two meanings here. A melja is a place of safety. For example, like a a fortress, a place where you feel safe. There is no place to feel safe. There is no place to feel safe. And the meaning of nakir is a place where you can be anonymous. You can uh, hide and nobody will see you. You can just hide somewhere. Maybe you're not safe, but you're hidden. Because people in a terror look for two things. They either look for a safe place or they look to hide somewhere where nobody can find them. And the word wazar, it covers both of these two. Yani, kalla la wazar, there is nowhere safe for you to hide, to, to be, and there is no place for you to hide. <clears throat> and that's why he said, and it is no place for you to protect yourself, and there's no place for you to hide. He said, وَلِهَذَا قَالَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ يَوْمَئِذٍ مُسْتَقَرٍ أي المرجع والمصير. To your Lord on that day is the place that you're going to come back to. And you're all going to be made to stand in front of Allah. You're all going back to Allah. No one is going to be protected. No one is going to be able to hide. No one's going to be able. And in such a big crowd, you think maybe I could stay anonymous. People might not see me. I can just hide. But there is nowhere to hide. There is nowhere to be safe. There is nobody who's going to stand up for you and protect you. On the day that a person will run away from their spouse, they'll run away from their father, they'll run away from their mother, they'll run away from their children. There's no shafa'a to shafi'een. There's no intercession from anyone. There's nobody going to protect you because of family ties. Nobody's going to protect you. 
because you used to be with them in this world. People will be enemies to each other on that day except for the muttaqeen, the people of taqwa. People will be enemies to each other on that day. So this is the meaning that is found in these ayahs. People, when you see the terrors of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, and of course the terrors of Yawm Al-Qiyamah is one of the themes of the surah. Ahwal Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the terrors of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. A person's natural reaction will be, Ain al Where can I run away to? Is there a place I can hide? Is there somebody can protect me? Is there a place that I can be safe from this punishment? Kalla la was. There's nothing, nobody going to help you, no place to run away, nowhere you can hide. Instead, all of you are going to be driven before, until you stand before Allah Azza wa Jal and you answer for what it is that you did. Then Allah Azza wa Jal said, يُنَبَّأُ الْإِنسَانُ يَوْمَئِذٍ بِمَا قَدَّمَ وَأَخْرَ أَيُّخْبِرُ بِجَمِيعِ أَعْمَالِهِ قديمها وحديثها أولها وآخرها صغيرها وكبيرها كما قال تعالى ووجد ما عمل حاضرا ولا يظلم ربك أحدا وهكذا قال ها هنا بل الإنسان على نفسه بصيرة ولو ألقى معاد He says you نبأ الإنسان We remind ourselves like we said in سورة النبأ The word نبأ is used for Al-Khabar Al-Azim, a very big, significant, important event. You don't say Naba for something like small. Like Naba is like a war broke out. That is Naba. Uh, Naba is I mean, that there was a catastrophe and many thousands of people died. This is Naba. But you don't say Naba for like, you know, about there's a class tomorrow. Like for this you say Khabar. So the Arabs, they use the word Naba for Al-Amr Al-Azim, something very, very, very serious that happened. Hey. And that's what Allah says about your deeds. insan. That man on that day, and this insan is general, everybody, and he be informed of what was done before, any. Qaddama and what was yani, what was done later. So that's what Ibn Kathir he says here. He says, Qadimiha wa hadithiha. The all the things you did and the things you did right at the end of your life. Right? From the beginning of your life to the end of your life. Awwaliha wa akhiriha. The first thing you did until the last thing you did. Sahiriha wa kabiriha. The little things and the big things you did. All of it you're going to be informed. You're going to be informed about it. Like the statement of Allah, وَوَجَدُ They found what they had done present in front of them. وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا Your Lord does not oppress anybody. There are other opinions regarding this al Opinion that Ibn Kathir brought here is not the only opinion. But we can see it's the most obvious of the opinions. And he said, In some of them, for example, they said, uh, What you, and the good deeds you took with you, and the wealth that you left behind in this world for your relatives, and things like that. But none of that is, is very obvious in the tafsir. The clear tafsir of it is everything you have done from the beginning of your life until the end of your life, you're going to be told about it. And your Lord will not oppress you in anything. And that's why Allah said, بَلِ الْإِنسَانُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَصِيرَةِ وَلَوْ أَلْقَى مَعَذِيرَةِ Ibn Kathir, he says here, أَيْ هُوَ شَهِيدٌ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ عَالِمٌ بِمَا فَعَلَهُ وَلَوْ اِعْتَذَرَ وَأَنْكَرَ كَمَا قَالَ تَعَالَى اِقْرَأْ كِتَابَكَ كَفَى بِنَفْسِكَ الْيَوْمَ عَلَيْكَ حَسِيبًا وقال علي بن عبي طلحة عن ابن عباس بل الإنسان على نفسه بصيرة يقول سمعه وبصره ويداه ورجلاه وجوارحه 
وقال قتادة شاهد على نفسه وفي رواية قال إذا شئت والله رأيته بصيرا بعيوب الناس وذنوبهم غافلا عن ذنوبه So here there are quite a few different opinions we have to sort out here from the statement of Ibn Kathir. The most obvious, بَلِ الْإِنسَانُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَصِيرَةً A person knows fine well about themselves. And whatever, and here he says basir, the meaning of basir or basira here, it means shahid. That's the first opinion. And that's the first one Ibn Kathir brings. It means you are a witness against yourself. No matter what excuses you bring, you yourself know who you are and you know what you've done. And that's why if you think about it, how many times do those people excuse themselves or try to Yawm Al-Qiyamah? Wallahi Rabbina ma kunna mushrikeen. Wallahi we never used to make shit with you, O oh Allah. Bal al-insan wa ala nafsihi basir. Person knows themselves fine. You know yourself fine well. وَلَوْ أَلْقَامَ عَذِيرًا Even if you try to make excuses يوم القيامة to say what you did, you know what you're going to come in front of Allah with. And you know yourself. So you are, that's one, that you are shahidun ana. And you know yourself, that's the first one. The second one is that your own body will testify against you. This is the second opinion about the ayah or the second meaning you can take from the ayah. It, yani even if your tongue excuses your actions, your hands and your limbs are going to speak against you. As we've heard in the many ayahs of the Quran who speak about that. So the first one is the person knows themselves and you know yourself fine well. And you know what you have done and when you read that book, you know that these are the deeds that I did. Even if you try to say, no, I, did, I didn't do it. You know fine well that what you read in that book is what you did. You know yourself. The second one is, even if you excuse yourself with your tongue, your hands and your feet and your skin is going to testify what you did. The third that is mentioned about this ayah is, that this ayah doesn't have to just apply Yawm Al-Qiyamah. But even in this world, بَنِ الْإِنسَانُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَصِيرًا Even in this world, you know the person that you really are. Or you should know the person that you really are. Even if you make excuses, even if you present a different face to and even though I don't think this is the main tafsir of the ayah because of the fact that the ayah is talking about Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the Siyah is Yawm Al-Qiyamah. But it's a point of benefit to mention generally that we human beings know ourselves. Even you come to the dars, you wear the best clothing, you sit, you make hurts, but you know what is in that cavity in your chest. What is it like? You know the person you are like when you switch off the light and when you close the door, you know the person at that time, who you really are. Even if you show a different face to the people. Some of the scholars took this from the Lugha of the Ayah as well, even though it's not the Tafsir. I don't say it's the Tafsir of the Ayah. I think it's Mimma Yustafadu min al Ayah. And you can benefit it from the Ayah. But it's not the Tafsir, because the Tafsir is Yawm Al-Qiyam. But what you can benefit from the ayah, what you can take from the ayah. Some of them said, it could be also the plural of mi'dar, meaning sitar, the curtains, sutur. When you put your curtain down, when you put close your curtain at night, you draw your curtains. Even when you draw your curtains, you know who is behind the curtain. Does that make sense? That's not the tafsir of the ayah because it, it's fine. You can take the, the language, the language accommodates. 
but the context and the tafsir of the salaf doesn't accommodate. But the language it accommodates. The word ma'adira, it can mean your curtains. Walaw alqa ma'adira. And even if he closes his curtains. But what you can benefit from it, it is a benefit, a genuine benefit. That when you close your curtain and you switch the light and you close the door and you lock the door and there's nobody sees you except Allah. You still see yourself. Even how you show yourself in front of people, how you present yourself, how good you make out yourself to be, but you still know the person who closes the curtains at night, who is he? You know yourself. Don't fool, you can't fool you. You can fool everybody else. You can't fool yourself. You certainly can't fool Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mimma yustafad min al-ayah. The reason I say that is some of them mentioned it as a tafsir. Again, as a tafsir, it has a problem. The problem as a tafsir is that it is khilaf al-mutabadir. It's not what comes to mind. It's, you have to kind of like go around the ayah. Like you have to kind of say, okay, ma'adhir, it could mean this. And it, like you have to kind of go around. But you, you do benefit. You do think about it. That if you want to be successful Yawm al Qiyamah and you want to be able to pass this great exam in front of Allah that Allah tells you everything you've done, the first thing you need to do is look at your own self today. Who, who is this person inside? Not how do I show myself to the people. Everybody shows their best face to the people. But you look at yourself inside tonight when you switch off the light and you close the curtain and you ask, who am I? Because you should, you can look at yourself, you know who you are. So we just finished this part of the tafsir, inshallah. Uh, so we said, وَلَوْ أَلْقَى مَعَذِيرَهُ Ibn Kathir, he says, وَقَالَ مُجَاهِدْ وَلَوْ جَادَلَ عَنْهَا فَهُوَ بَصِيرٌ عَلَيْهَا وَقَالَ خَتَادَهُ لَوْ اعْتَذَرَ يَوْمَئِذٍ بِالْبَاطِلِ لَا يُقْبَلُ مِنْ وَقَالَ السُدِّي وَلَوْ أَلْقَى مَعَذِيرَ حُجَّتَهُ كَقَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى ثُمَّ لَمْ تَكُنْ فِتْنَتُهُمْ إِلَّا أَنْ قَالُوا وَاللَّهِ رَبِّنَا مَا كُنَّا مُشْرِكِينَ وَكَقَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى يَوْمَ يَبْعَثُهُمُ اللَّهُ جَمِيعًا فَيَحْرِفُونَ لَهُ كَمَا يَحْرِفُونَ لَكُمْ وَيَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ عَلَى شَيْءٍ أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ هُمُ الْكَاذِبُونَ So he brings a number of different statements from the scholars of tafsir what with regard to the meaning of even if he gives his excuses. He says, even if he argues Yawm al Qiyam about what he's done, in reality, he knows the reality of himself. And Qatada, he says, even if he tries to make excuses with falsehood on that day, those false excuses will not be accepted from him. And as Suddi, he said, his arguments that he makes, he tries to present his arguments, but it will not be accepted. Like them saying, Wallahi Rabbina ma kunna mushrikin. Like them saying, Wallahi Rabbina ma kunna mushrikin. I swear by Allah, we never made ship like that. Or like them swearing to Allah like they swear to you. And they, they swear an oath to Allah, Wallahi, we never did it. Even like they used to swear to you in this world. He said, وَقَالَ الْعَوْفِي عَنْ ابْنِ عَبَّاسٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمَا وَلَوْ أَلْقَى مَعَاذِيرًا هِيَ الْاِعْتِذَارِ In the excuses. The opinion of Ibn Abbas, the excuses. أَلَمْ تَسْمَعْ عَنَّهُ قَالْ لَا يَنْفَعُ الظَّالِمِينَ مَعَذِرَتُهُمْ This ayah in Surah Ghafir. لَا يَنْفَعُ الظَّالِمِينَ the oppressive people will not benefit from their excuses. This is a good proof, I mean, this is a good evidence to use that this is the meaning of the ayah in Surah Al-Qiyam. Because even though people said, well, the ayah could mean like this or it could mean like that, but the ayah in Surah Ghafir tells us clearly that they will try to make excuses for what they did, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, and those excuses will not benefit them. And that is definitely what comes to mind in the ayah here. So when you listen to the ayah here, what comes to mind and what 
is apparent from the wording is the same meaning in Surah Ghafir. That their excuses will not benefit them. And he also mentions and the statement for al salama uh, in the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, فَعَلْ قُسْسَلَمَ مَا كُنَّا نَعْمَلُ مِنْ سُوءٍ And when they used to say, they used to give excuses before Allah that we didn't do anything bad. And when they said, وَاللَّهِ رَبِّنَا مَا كُنَّا مُشْرِكِينَ That by Allah, our Lord, we never made a part of them. That these excuses will not benefit them. They're not going to benefit from these excuses that they made. Having said that, that they will not benefit from the excuses and that this is the apparent meaning of the ayah, it is worthwhile keeping in mind the meaning that we mentioned, that a person knows themselves in this world and they should look at themselves and take themselves to account. And this is linked to an nafs al the soul that blames themselves. Look at yourself, know yourself. And there's a small benefit in this. I just wanted to mention it from the benefits here. And that is that it's not even your excuses, but even what other people say about you in this world. Someone praises you. It's what is befitting for a person is for a person to know who they really are. And if you are basirun binafsik, you know who you are, then really the praise of the people shouldn't make you proud of yourself because you see wallahi this person doesn't know me if this person who praises me they don't know me they don't know what i do they don't know who i am they don't know what's in my heart there's a statement like that from imam ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala that he said that if a person knows themselves the praise of the people doesn't affect them so this is a benefit you can also think of. You, sh you should know yourself and you should see the mistakes you've made and you should realize how much you have disobeyed Allah and you should realize how much you are in need of Allah's forgiveness and pardon. And if you know this about yourself, then perhaps this will make the examination Yawm Al-Qiyamah easy. And there are people it's made easy for. There are people who will have hisab and yasira, an easy account. And like Al Hassan al Basri said, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, we mentioned last week, that the people who make their account hard for themselves in this life and they look at themselves in this life, they will have an easy account, Yawm al Qiyamah. But the people who are easy on themselves in this life, they will not look or they will, they will have a difficult account, Yawm al Qiyamah. There is one more meaning in the ayah which we didn't mention. Some of them said the word bell here, what it indicates is that some people spend their time busy with other people's problems. Bell insanu ala nafsihi basira. I'll read you what Ibn Kathir said about it because it's worthwhile. Uh, he said, رأيته بصيرا بعيوب الناس وذنوبهم غافلا عن ذنوبهم. You see some people, they're busy with other people's mistakes, but they don't look at their own mistakes. And if they were to look at their own mistakes, they would see the severity of what they have, but they're busy with the mistakes of other people. And he said, and he said, you call it. إن في الإنجيل مكتوبا يعني it's written in the إنجيل يا بنا آدم تبصر القذاة في عين أخيك وتترك الجذع في عينك لا تبصر. I mean he said from that which is said that it's written in the إنجيل that you see the any speck of dust or the speck in your brother's eye and you ignore the big you know, branch you have in your own eye and you have you have, a, you have a huge problem yourself, but you look at the tiny, tiny problem that the other person has. So this is Mibma Yustafad. I don't think, again, tafsir of the ayah, the direct tafsir, maybe it's a bit much. But to say that you can benefit from the ayah, that you should be looking at yourself, not looking at the mistakes of other people. There is something amazing in this 
I would advise everyone to read it if you can. And that is the advice of Abbad ibn Abbad al Khawas to the Ummah. It's mentioned in Sunan al Darimi. It's been translated into English in a book called From the Advice of the Salaf. It's a very nice book. There's the advice of Abbad ibn Abbad to the Ummah. His name is Abbad ibn Abbad al Khawas al Ar Sufi, something like that. His name it was from the companions of Sufyan al Thawri. And he wrote about this issue. Like in his advice, he wrote about there are some people who are so busy with the mistakes of other people, they never look at their own mistakes. The first person you should look at, it doesn't mean you should never look at anyone else's mistakes. We're not saying you should never correct someone or never make it kar al munkar. You should. We're not saying never ever criticize on it, but we're just seeing that some people, their only concern is what other people do. And they never ever look at what's in their own. And if they look at the tiny speck in their brother's eye, they don't see the big block that's in their own eye. There are some people like that. So don't misunderstand that this means you don't criticize or you don't correct somebody or you don't look out for a mistake and, and help people to get over it. But at the same time, don't be someone who is and you're busy with the mistakes of other people and you never ever look at your own mistakes. And that's Mimma Yustafadu min al You can take like you can take it from the eye and believe in sad or ala nafs basira. Walaw alqa ma'az. Inshallah ta'ala next week we'll try to go as quick as we can. Uh, I don't know how much more time we will have, or if we will even get another week after next week, I'm not sure. But because we want in Ramadan, we will not be able to. But at least, inshallah ta'ala, we will try our best to finish the surah before uh, we break for Ramadan, inshallah. So I think it's better for us to stop now so we don't get in the way of salah uh, and people can go and make wudu. And uh, maybe we can catch any questions at the end. That's what Allah Azza wa made easy for me to mention. Allah knows best. Wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala uh, وصحبه أجمعين